Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Uh, first question tonight, how do we reconcile Genesis 6-6 six, six and Numbers 23-19? One verse said, says that the Lord repented, and another verse says that He doesn't repent. So let's get both passages. We need Genesis 6-6, six, six, and then we read Numbers 23-19. So we'll start in Genesis 6.6. 6. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, and we'll look at verse 6. And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. So in Genesis 6.6, 6, it's, it's fairly wow. clear that the Lord repented, and it repented the Lord that He had made man. When it says that, what is the, the meaning of that verse? In other words, when it says that the Lord repented, what is it saying? Is it saying that God stopped His pattern of sinful behavior? Well, that, that's obviously not what it's saying. But if you just read the verse, don't you get the sense of it that the Lord is grieved in His heart about man's behavior? And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him at His heart. So in Genesis 6, 6, the Lord clearly repented. Get Numbers 23, verse 19. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 23, and we'll look at verse 19. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And so you see the, the issue here. Genesis 6, 6 says, and it repented the Lord. In other words, the Lord repented. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man, neither the son of man, that he should repent. The sense of Numbers 23, 19 is that God not only doesn't repent, but can't repent, because He's neither the Son of Man that He should repent. So what do you do if there's a verse that says, God repented, Genesis 6, 6, and there's a verse that says, God doesn't repent, because He's God, Numbers 23, 19. Well, what's the answer? Well, I suppose one answer is you could say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. That's obviously an unsatisfactory answer. So what is the correct answer? <clears throat> to understand the correct answer, we're going to look at the, <clears throat> the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. So you can see here I've pulled up the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. We're looking at the word repent, and we'll look at a couple different definitions here. As you, as you well know, Words often have different meanings. In other words, the same word can be used in multiple different senses. So let's just look. There's multiple in here, as you can see, but I'm going to just focus on the first three. So repent, first meaning, to feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken as to repent that we have lost much time in idleness or sensual pleasure, to repent that we have injured or wounded the feelings of a friend. A person repents only of what he himself has done or said. Second, to express sorrow for something past. Thir three, or third, to change the mind in consequence of the inconvenience or injury done by past conduct. Now, in looking at those three different senses of the word repent, let me ask you this question. Of those three, which of those meanings is closest to what we read in Genesis 6.6? 6? And I'll remind you what Genesis 6.6 6 said is, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Which of those three is closest to that? 
Well, it's number one, isn't it? To feel pain, sorrow, or regret for something done or spoken. Now, obviously, in Genesis 6, 6, God didn't sin. When God created man, God didn't sin. But was God grieved because of man's behavior? And the answer is that he was. God was grieved in his heart. Now, in Numbers 23, 19, I'll read the verse in which one of these is the closest sense. Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Well, which sense is the word being used in Numbers 23, 19? And it's the third one to change the mind in consequence of the inconvenience or injury done by past conduct. So, actually, just you're in Numbers 23, 19. Let's read a couple more verses so you get the sense of the context. So, Numbers 23, 19. Behold, I have received commandment, or verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Well, the idea there is, does God say things, and then he thinks about it for a while, and he realizes, you know, I never should have said that, and so I'm going to do something else. Is that what God does? No, he never does that. When God decided to bless Israel, did God see their behavior for a couple hundred years and say, well, you know, in Genesis 12, I thought this was a great idea. But then things played out, and now I wish I wouldn't have done that. You realize that God doesn't repent in that sense. He doesn't change his mind. When God decrees, this is who I'm going to bless, and these are the things that I'm going to accomplish with them, he doesn't repent. He doesn't change his mind about that. So, to answer the question, what do you do with the verses that will say God repented and other verses where it says God doesn't repent? You can either say, well, the Bible is contradicting itself, or you can simply observe what is obvious, that the same word can be used in different senses. I'm just going to say one more thing to just make this obvious. If you take the word run, sometimes the word run means to sprint, to walk really fast. Sometimes the word run means to execute a program. Like, in other words, you need to run this operation. Well, the word run has multiple different meanings. And so what you do is when you see the word run, you look at the context in which it is being used to determine the sense of the word. The same thing is true with the word repent. Next question. There are so many different opinions about the firmament and the waters. Can you explain exactly what God did in Genesis 1 verses 6 through 8? So let's turn to Genesis 1 and verses 6 through 8. So Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Based upon what we read in Genesis 1, verses 6 through 8, what is the firmament? What does verse 8 say it is? Heaven. Isn't that what it says? And God called the firmament heaven. What would be the 
word we would use. And actually, I'm going to let me let me do this instead. I'm first going to let's look it up together here in the 1828. So I'm going to type in the word firmament. And let's read it here. The region of the air, the sky or heavens. In scripture, the word denotes an expanse, a wide extent. For such is the signification of the Hebrew word, coinciding with regio, region, and reach. Now notice this next sentence. The original, therefore, does not convey the sense of solidity, but of stretching extension. The great arch or expanse over our heads in which are placed the atmosphere and the clouds and which the stars appear to be placed and are really seen. Now, one comment before I go on. There are some today that will say the word firmament means firm, and thus there is some sort of firm boundary to the atmosphere. Does the word firmament come from the word firm? Not according to the dictionary. The original, therefore, does not convey the sense of solidity. Okay. So now, firmament means what? What would be the common word we would use today in place of firmament? Space. It's not just the atmosphere. It's not just the atmosphere. Look at what it says here. The great arch or expanse over our heads in which are placed the atmosphere and the clouds and in the which the stars appear to be placed and are really seen. Here's what happens. God creates the earth and there's a bunch of water on top of the earth. What God then does is he places the firmament in between the waters, right? So look with me at Genesis 1, verse 6 again. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were under above the firmament, and it was so. Look with me at verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas, and God saw that it was good. So the waters under the firmament are obviously on the earth. Genesis 1, 9 and 10 calls them seas. In modern language, we would call them oceans, right? But in addition to the waters under the firmament, there are waters above the firmament. Those waters are not clouds. Get with me Psalm 148, verse 4. Psalm 148, verse 4. Now, while you're turning there, let me ask you this question. How many heavens are there in the Scriptures? There are three. Now, the first heaven in the Scriptures is where birds fly. And so that heaven, we would use what term to describe it? The atmosphere, right? It's the atmosphere directly around the earth. That's the first heaven. The second heaven is the heaven above the first heaven. And what word would we use to describe that today? Outer space or space, right? So the first heaven is the atmosphere where birds fly. The second heaven is the heaven that is outside that, that is above that, that we would call space or outer space. Now read with me Psalm 148, verse 4. Psalm 148, verse 4. Praise Him, 
ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. So Psalm 148 verse 4 says there are waters and they are above what? Heavens, plural. So if it's above the heavens, plural, it has to be above at least how many heavens? Two, right? So there is the first heaven, which is the atmosphere around the earth. There is the second heaven, which is space. What's the third heaven? Or let me give you an example. Who lives in the third heaven? God does. Well, if there's waters above the heavens, plural, then there must be waters between which two of the heavens? The second and third. And so what God did is when he created the earth and he created the water around the earth, when he made the firmament, what he did is there are some waters that remain on the earth. They've been gathered together in one area. Those are seas, S-E-A-S. And then there are waters that are above not the first heaven, but they are above the second heaven, and they obviously separate between the third heaven and the second heaven, and that's the waters above the heavens. So that, that's what God did when he constructed the universe. So that's what's going on in Genesis 1, verses 6 and 8. We'll go on to the next question. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm embarrassed it took me so long to get to this question. The question is, is Acts 10 prophecy related to Israel, or is it related to the body of Christ's mystery? I'm so backlogged on some of these questions, and I should have gotten to this simple question a long time ago, so my apologies for that. Um, so let's deal with the question. The book of Acts is a transition book. In Acts chapter 10, so turn with me Acts chapter 10, and look with me at um, verse 44, Acts 10, 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now you recall that in Acts chapter 10, what happens is Peter has a vision three times, and then he goes to Gentiles. And let me just back up and say this. Peter falls into a trance in Genesis 10. He has a vision that says, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And what he sees is all manner of beasts and creeping things. And when he hears, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter's response to that is, Of course not. No, I'm not going to do that because a bunch of those animals were unclean. He sees the vision three times. When he doubts in himself what the vision sh should mean, He's then, there are Gentiles that arrive at his doorstep that he goes with, and what happens at the end of the chapter is the Holy Ghost falls upon them. Okay, so we understand that. Let me ask you this question. When Peter was speaking to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, did he preach to them the gospel of the kingdom, or did he preach the gospel of the grace of God that was given to Paul? And he obviously preached the gospel of the kingdom because, number one, that was his gospel, and number two, he hadn't even heard of Paul's gospel at that point in time. So in Acts chapter 10, what gospel is Peter teaching? It has to be the gospel of the kingdom. There's nothing else it could possibly be. It's the only gospel that he knew at that time. So you can decide for yourself. It seems to me what happens to Peter's converts in Acts chapter 10 is they are made part of the kingdom program, because they heard Peter's gospel. Now, what happens in Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 10 is part of the transition that takes place in the book of Acts. When you start the book of Acts, Peter and the twelve are in Jerusalem in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost, and it's very clear that the kingdom program is in effect. When you get to the middle of the book of Acts, what do you not see mentioned at all in the last 10 chapters, and that's Peter. And in fact, if you read the last 13 chapters of the book of Acts, whose ministry is it 
focused on. It's focused on Paul's ministry. So what happens in the book of Acts is you start with the kingdom church in full effect, but by the time you get to Acts 28, the kingdom church has diminished in importance. When you read Romans 11, it will talk about the fall and diminishing of Israel. What happens in the middle of the book of Acts is Paul is saved. He's given a ministry to the Gentiles, and his ministry is ascendant. His ministry becomes more important. So what you're seeing is the kingdom program declines, Paul's ministry increases, and as you read through Acts, you just notice that on every page. So Acts chapter 10 seems to, to me to be about the kingdom program, and it's about Peter coming to the realization that what God has done is Gentiles have been cleansed, just like he was told, arise, Peter, kill and eat, those unclean animals, and that the middle wall of partition that existed in time past has been broken down. And that's evidenced by the blessing that comes to the Gentiles by receiving the Holy Spirit. Next question. This question is simply this. Do angels have blood? So get Hebrews 1 verse 7. So do angels have blood? And the answer is yes, it's O positive. Uh, no, let's, let's, let's dig in a little more deeply on that. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who, make, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. So angels are said to be there. They're said to have been made spirits. Look with me at Luke 24, 39. Luke chapter 24 and verse 39. Luke 24, verse 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and blown bones as ye see me have. So does a spirit have flesh and bones? The answer to that is no. Get Genesis 9 verse 4. Genesis 9 Verse 4, when God gives his instructions to Noah about what he can eat, notice what he says in, in Genesis 9, 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. In other words, blood is the life of what? the life of the flesh. So let's put these three verses together. Angels are spirits. Spirits do not have flesh. Blood is the life of the flesh. Do angels have blood? I don't think so. Now, to be, for sake of completeness, angels may have spiritual bodies of some sort, uh, but they don't have earthly bodies in the way that, that we do. Get with me Jude verse 6. <clears throat> Jude verse 6. Jude in verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. And the idea there when it talks about angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation, what event is that referring to? It's referring to Genesis 6. In Genesis 6, what happens with the sons of God? They saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took of them wives which they chose. Jude describes that as the angels leaving their first estate. And so did angels 
have the ability to take upon themselves uh, human bodies to uh, perform the, the, the rebellion, the wickedness that they performed in Genesis 6? The answer to that is yes. Um, so get with me then. Um, get, get 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. And let's look at uh, one thing there that I think will just be helpful to uh, make this point. So look at me at 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now the thing to notice there is that Satan had the ability to transform his appearance. It was part of the, it, it was within his capabilities to do that, and it, it was, it's part of what he uses for his deception. Go with me if you would to Matthew 22, verse 30. Matthew chapter 22, verse 30. And there's a follow-up question here, and the question was this. Does Matthew 22, verse 30, imply that all women become men in the resurrection? So let's look at this. Matthew 22, verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. And so some will make the following argument. Uh, when you see angels in the Bible, they're, they're always male. You can see that in Matthew 22, verse 30, there's no marriage in the next life. And so they then ask the question, well, is, does everyone become a male in the next life? life. Let's go up to verse 23, and let's just read some of the context. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. Now let's read the, the next verse. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. What verse 30 is indicating, it seems to me, it's not suggesting that women become men in the next life, what it's suggesting is that there is no marriage in the next life because what happens is you're in spiritual bodies and the spiritual bodies are not designed for that sort of purpose. Look with me, if you would, at Luke 20, verse 35. Luke 20, verse 35. Whenever you face a passage that is difficult, what you want to do is you want to find other passages, you want to find other verses that shed light on the subject. So we're going to look here at Luke 20, verse 35, and I think it's going to help. Luke 20, verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, notice there's no period there. 
Neither can they die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels, and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. Luke 20, verse 36 says, Neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels. Now you may recall that in Hebrews 2, and let's just let's go ahead and look at it together. Get with me, Hebrews 2. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that thou visitest him? Verse 7. Thou madest him, that's man, a little lower than the angels. What is the relationship between men and angels in God's created order? Men are lower, but how much lower? A little lower than the angels. Now read verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels. So what does that phrase mean? He was made man, right? He was made a little lower than the angels. Now notice what it then says. For the suffering of death. When we were in Luke 20, verse 36, it said that in the resurrection, man would be what? Equal unto the angels? And because he was said to be equal unto the angels, what could he no longer do? He could no longer die. So when we take Hebrews 2 and Luke 20, here's what we notice. Man is made a little lower than the angels. It's very clear that being a little lower than the angels in Hebrews 2 means what? Angels can't die. Men can die. Luke 20 says that in the resurrection, man is made equal unto the angels, and what can he no longer do? Can no longer die. When you think about marriage, how long does marriage last? Until you, until you die, right? That, that's why humans can remarry. If your spouse dies, you can remarry, right? Now, the other thing, think of this as like, it's a reprieve. So what happens is, poor Stephanie, there's light at the end of the tunnel. All she has to do is wait till the rapture. And then that's it. She's free. She's, no, she's loosed from the law of her husband, as Romans 7 says. So what's going on with the resurrection? Is everyone made male? I don't think everyone's made male. But what happens is marriage is not an institution that exists in the, in the next life. It's clearly an institution in this life for the, among other things, the propagation of the species that's not going to occur in the next life. Let's go to the next question. In the Old Testament, Gentile men have to become circumcised to become a proselyte Jew. How does a Gentile woman become a proselyte Jew? Does she have to marry a Jew? And if so, what if no one wants to marry her? Okay. So get with me Esther 8, verse 17. Let's start there. Esther chapter 8. And verse 17. Esther 8. And verse 17. And in every province and in every city, 
whithersoever the king's commandment and his dec decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Very important verse. It makes it clear that the people of the land, in other words, Gentiles, have the ability to become a Jew. So is, in time past, being a Jew something that you are either born with or you're out of luck? No, because a Gentile has the ability to become a Jew. Get with me Exodus 12, verse 48. So we know from Esther 8, 17, that a Gentile in time past has the ability to become a Jew. Now let's look at Exodus 12, 48. Exodus 12, 48. And when a stranger, that's obviously a Gentile, shall sojourn with thee. So he's traveling with Israel. And will keep the Passover to the Lord... Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. So you're, if you're a Gentile that sojourns with Israel, what do you have to do to become part of of Israel and keep the Passover? And the answer is circumcision. If you are a Gentile that is circumcised, what is the difference between you and an Israelite that was born in the land? There's no difference, right? So in effect, that, that Gentile has become a Jew and what was necessary to accomplish that was circumcision. So we see how it works for males. The question is, how does it work for females? Can anyone think of someone in the Old Testament that we should look at for an example? Rahab is a possibility. Can anyone think of someone that we should look at in the book of Ruth? Let's do that. So get with me Ruth chapter 1 and verse 22. It's easier if I ask the question with the hint, isn't it? Um, so look with me at Ruth chapter 1 and verse 22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. You can see that what Ruth the Moabitess is doing is she is going to Israel with Naomi. What I want to focus on for the moment is Notice in that verse that Ruth is called Ruth the Moabitess. There are five times in Scripture where Ruth is referred to that way, where she's Ruth the Moabitess. Why does that matter? Get Judges 10, verse 6. Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. Judges chapter 10 and verse 6. And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon and the gods of the Philistines and forsook the Lord and served not him. Get 1 Kings 11, verse 33. 
1 Kings 11 and verse 33. Because that they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtaroth, the goddess of the Zidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and, and so on. The thing I want you to notice is, what did we learn in those two verses about the Moabites? They serve false gods, and they do not serve the God of Israel. In 1 Kings 11, 33, we're told the God they served, it's Chemosh, and Chemosh is not real. He's fake. Go back with me to Ruth, and look with me at Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. Ruth chapter 1, <coughs> verse 16. 16. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee. And this is where Naomi had said to, the, to Ruth, Ruth, don't come with me to Israel. Stay here with your people. And Ruth responds to that and says, Entreat me not to leave thee. Don't ask me to leave. Or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. The way that the book of Ruth is sometimes taught or understood is that what Ruth is doing is Ruth has great loyalty to her mother-in-law, and so she's following her mother-in-law. It, it seems to me what's going on is greater than that. What Ruth is choosing to do is she is choosing not to remain in Moab, but she's choosing to join herself to the nation of Israel, and not just to join herself to the nation of Israel, but to do what? To worship the God of Israel, right? And that's why what it says there is, thy people shall be my people, she's joining herself to Israel, and thy God, my God. Does Ruth come into a right relationship with God when she marries Boaz? Or does Ruth come into a right relationship with God when she chooses to join herself to God's people and worship the God of Israel? And it's obviously the second one, right? Ruth comes into a right relationship with God when she's choosing Israel and the God of Israel. So the question is, what does a woman in the Old Testament do when she wants to join herself to Israel, when she wants to worship the true God? Well, it's not the procedure of circumcision. What she's doing is she's joining herself to the nation of Israel, and she's choosing to worship Jehovah, the God of Israel. That's what's required in time past when the middle wall of partition is in effect. Next question, when during pregnancy does God impart a soul to a child? Get with me Genesis 2 verse 7. One answer that people sometimes give is they will say, a, a child receives a soul at the time of birth. And the reason why I'll say that is look at Genesis 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Notice this, and man became a living soul. And so what some will say is they will say, Adam became a living soul at the moment when he received the breath of life. And of course, an infant that is in the womb, what does it not do? It doesn't breathe, right? It just doesn't. Another verse that I'll give you, get Job 33, verse 4. Job 33, verse 4. So if you wanted to make the scriptural argument that 
a child doesn't become a living soul until it breathes. The verses to use are Genesis 2, verse 7, and then Job 33, verse 4. The Spirit of God hath made me, and the breath of the Almighty hath given me life. And so those are the verses you would use if you wanted to say, well, the child doesn't really become a living soul until it has the breath of life within it. Now, I don't personally believe that's the correct understanding. Look with me at Job 3, verse 3. Job chapter 3, verse 3. <clears throat> Job 3, 3. Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, notice this, there is a man child conceived. Well, the idea of that verse isn't the sense of it, that when conception occurs, what is it? It's a child. There's a man child conceived. Look with me at 2 Samuel 11, verse 5. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 5. 2 Samuel eleven five, 5. And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with potential life. She said, I am with a fetus. Used to be a zygote. Then it will become an embryo. No, what did she say? She says, I am with child, obviously. So the scriptural understanding of this is when does a child become a child? And the answer is it is at the moment of conception. Look with me at Luke 1, verse 44. <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verse 44. <clears throat> For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. This is a fascinating little passage. What's obviously happening is Mary is meeting Elizabeth. When that occurs, Mary is carrying the Lord Jesus Christ within her womb. And Elizabeth has John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ's ministry. So, so those two are together. And how does John the Baptist react? He leaps for joy, indicating awareness, cognition, emotion, all of the things, the attributes that a human being possesses, right? Right? He, he leaped for joy, and he's obviously thrilled to be in the presence of the second person of the Godhead. Now, some will say, well, a fetus, it's not yet a human being because it cannot exist separate from the mother. It's dependent upon the mother, so it's not really independent life. As you think about that, a three-month-old can't really exist independently. It needs someone to feed it and take care of it because young life, by its nature, is dependent upon parents. But if that's not to say that it's not life. It still plainly is. The final thought I'll leave you with on this subject is this. When you think of a fertilized egg... The only thing necessary for a one-celled fertilized egg to become a mature human adult, there's only three things required. Time, water, and nutrition. There's nothing else required. The single fertilized egg has all the DNA that you will ever possess. It has the information that will determine your hair color, your eye color, your build, all of the, all the genetic material that you ever will have, unless you do something to alter it, is already present. 
So it's, it's, it's fairly obvious that what happens is at conception, the child comes into existence and has a, a, an eternal soul that will, that will never die. <clears throat> Next question. When did the middle wall of partition come down? Get Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. The question is, when did the middle wall of partition come down? And I'm going to go ahead and, and give you the answer up front, and then we'll see if I can prove it. The middle wall of partition came down in Acts chapter 9. So look with me at Ephesians 2 verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You can see that in time past there's a distinction between Gentiles and Israel, between circumcision and uncircumcision. Verse 13, but now, present day during the dispensation of grace, but now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Gentiles used to be, made, used to be far off, but now they've been made nigh. Verse 14, for he is our peace. The he is obviously a reference to Jesus Christ. For he is our peace who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. So there must have been in time past a middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. So the question is, when did it come down? Look with me at Acts. We're going to come back to Ephesians 2. But for the moment, get Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, and look at verse 1. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. The his is Stephen from Acts chapter 7. Paul was consenting to that death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So Acts chapter 8, verse 1, when Stephen is martyred, there is great persecution against the kingdom church, and the, and the kingdom church is therefore scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, except for the apostles. The apostles remain in Jerusalem. Now, with 8.1 as, as context, look at Acts 11, verse 19. Acts 11, verse 19. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen. Well, that's what we just read in Acts 8, chapter, Acts chapter 8, verse 1. The kingdom church was scattered as a result of the persecution that arose after Stephen's death. Now, notice what this says. Now, they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch. It tells you how far they're spread. Notice preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So let me ask you this. In Acts chapter 8, did the kingdom church think the middle wall of partition had been broken down? No, because when they're scattered abroad outside of Jerusalem, who do they preach to? And the answer is only Jews. So was the middle wall of partition broken down by Acts 8? The kingdom church didn't think it was. Get Ephesians 2, verse 15. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Verse 16 and that he might reconcile both into, unto God 
in one body, that's obviously a reference to the body of Christ, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now here's what some folks do. They read Ephesians 2.16, and it talks about reconciling both, and that's Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body. And they say, well, I know when that happened. Ephesians 2.16 tells me it was at the cross. But does that verse say at the cross? It says it's by the cross. Now, by the way, when the cross occurred, did the kingdom church immediately start running out and preaching to Gentiles? You know they didn't, because in Acts chapter 8, which is much later, what do they do? They preach only to Jews. Acts 8, 1. Acts 11, verse 19. Now, you understand this, obviously. Is there sometimes a difference between when you pay for something and when it takes effect? And the answer, of course, is yes. Was the body of Christ purchased by the cross? Yes, it was purchased by the cross. Did it begin at the cross? No, it didn't begin at the cross. Let me give you a proof of that. Who is the first member of the body of Christ? Paul. Paul. So was Paul saved at the time of the cross? No. No. When does Paul get saved? Acts 9. So guess when the middle wall of partition had to have been broken down? In Acts 9, when Paul becomes a member of the body of Christ. It can't be that the body of Christ began before Acts 9, because, well, if it did, how many, let me ask it this way, how many people were in the body of Christ before Acts 9? None, because Paul is the first member of the body of Christ. Look with me at Ephesians 2, verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. The middle wall of partition is broken down with Paul's ministry. Get with me Acts 26, verse 14. Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. <laughs> Paul's conversion in Acts 9 is so significant that the book of Acts talks about his conversion in three different chapters. It talks about in Acts 9, talks about in Acts 22, talks about in Acts 26. It's not doing that because the Holy Spirit ran out of things to say and was trying to fill space. It's, it's recounting that event three times because there are significant details that have to be shared about it. Look at me at Acts 26, verse 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, this is a recounting of Acts 9, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, verse 17, delivering thee from the people, Notice this, and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Quick question. When does Paul's sending to the Gentiles begin? Does it begin in Acts 28, as some would say? Or does it begin in Acts 9 when Paul's when, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears to Paul and says to him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. So this is actually really easy, I think. In Acts chapter 8, 
when the kingdom church was scattered and the kingdom church was preaching the gospel, who were the only people they preached to? Jews. They didn't think the middle wall of partition was broken down. In Acts 9, when the Lord Jesus Christ appears to Paul and tells him what his ministry is, what does he tell him? You're going to have a ministry that goes directly to Gentiles. Do you remember in Matthew 10 when the Lord said, go not into the way of the Gentiles? Well, he said, go not into the way of the Gentiles because the middle wall of partition was in effect. When he says to Paul, I'm going to send you unto the Gentiles, guess what had been broken down? The middle wall of partition. So it's rather straightforward. What's fascinating then, Acts chapter 8, the kingdom church is scattered. They preach only to Jews because the middle wall of partition is in effect. Acts 10, God saves the apostle, the Gentiles, and specifically tells them he's going to go to Gentiles. What happens in Acts 10? Well, God tells Peter the middle wall of partition has been broken down because the Holy Spirit falls upon Gentiles. We'll go ahead and uh, stop there. Let me close us in a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you, Lord, for the, the truth of your word. We thank you for its infallibility, its perfection. And we pray, Lord, that we would just come to a better understanding of it and that we would please you in all that we do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.